My name is Pat Staley, and I'm the COO of TriClinic Labs, which is a contract research organization specializing in solid-state physical and analytical chemistry. I'd like to thank Ragaku for the opportunity to present some of our work here today. The project I'll discuss was well underway prior to TriClinic obtaining low-frequency Raman capability, so there are other techniques that will be discussed as, in addition to that. I think, however, that the potential for low-frequency Raman spectroscopy and polymorph identification and quantitation is pretty well illustrated. You notice the title of my talk has a phrase, almost isoenergetic polymorphs. Uh, isoenergetic is a term that was coined by Karstensen in 1995, and his definition is shown there at the top of the slide. Actually, as later pointed out by Ulrich Greaser, it's unlikely that two polymorphs will be absolutely isoenergetic. He was looking, Ulrich was looking at the phenobarbital polymorph shown below. These are pictures from the crystal structures, and you can see the packing is quite similar in both of those. And his definition of polymorphs of that type is that they are energetically almost indistinguishable. And I think that's probably a better description than isoenergetic. And I use the term also iso, almost isoenergetic to describe a similar situation, which I'll describe to you now. The system we were studying consists of a small molecule API that is suspended in an aqueous vehicle to make drug product. I can't show you the structure of the API at this time, but that won't hinder discussion of its solid state chemistry. That API was found to exist in three crystalline forms, two anhydrous polymorphs, one and two, as well as a hydrate, number three. Competitive slurry experiments show that anhydrate 2 is more stable than anhydrate 1 between minus 15 and 40 degrees. And it was interesting to see that hydrate 3 is formed in the presence of water only at low temperature. For example, we found it at minus 15 degrees C, but not at 25 degrees C. So when the drug product is made, what was done initially was to use polymorph 1 suspended in that aqueous vehicle. And because the temperatures were not as low as necessary, hydrate 3 is not generated in the drug product. So we won't discuss that any further. Now, here are comparisons of the results of analyses of polymorphs 1 and 2 by various techniques. You can see they are somewhat distinguishable by X-ray powder diffraction, as in the upper left corner, in that polymorph 2 has some unique freestanding peaks uh, not present in the uh, pattern of polymorph 1. That means that it will be hard to distinguish between polymorph one that's pure and polymorph one that may have a small amount of polymorph two in it. And the importance of that will become uh, more apparent in later slides. But take a look at the other techniques, uh, the infrared, the Raman, that is the standard frequency Raman, and the DSC and TG data. And basically the two polymorphs are indistinguishable by any of those techniques. Uh, even when we blow these up and examine these spectra very closely, they're essentially identical. We were able to obtain crystal structures of both polymorph 1 and polymorph 2 and find that those structures are very uh, similar, as were the phenobarbital structures I showed you a couple slides ago. In this case, there's only one real difference between the two, which is along the C-axis, where in polymorph 1 there is simply a translation, but in polymorph 2 there's a two-fold screw. So as you can see from the cartoon at the top, they're very similar. It's just the, the inversion of one compared to the other. Also, you'll notice that the number of hydrogen bonds and the lengths of those hydrogen bonds are essentially the same in both structures. Why did TriClinic become involved in this project in the first place? The reason was that an issue was recognized during stability studies of drug products. And that's illustrated by these photomicrographs on this slide. The freshly prepared drug product is on the left, and you can see it contains featureless solids. Uh, the reason for that is the polymorph one that was used was micronized before it was suspended into the aqueous vehicle. However, with time, even at the temp fairly low temperature of five degrees, there was quite a change, and you now see the growth of larger needle-like crystals. And so based on that observation, there were questions that were raised. The first one is, what is happening? The second one is, can we follow what is happening analytically? And the third, how can we avoid this to generate a stable drug product? So the first thing we did was to generate a slurry of micronized polymorph 1 in the aqueous vehicle, and we heated that mixture to 40 degrees C. 
that temperature provided fast enough conversion so that we could follow it over follow the conversion over a period of hours rather than weeks as we would have had to do if we worked at five degrees C. So we withdrew samples at various time points, uh, isolated the solids, and analyzed them by both particle sizing and X-ray powder diffraction. You can see particle size data there on the left. And clearly, there is an increase in particle size, which levels off somewhere around 12 to 15 hours. In the X-ray patterns, we can see the uh, growth of freestanding polymorph two peaks with time. For example, if you look at the uh, second yellow bar from the left, you'll see that there is a, one of the freestanding peaks is growing. Also, note though the most le the leftmost yellow bar where it appears that what looks like a doublet at zero hours actually converges into a singlet by 15 hours. And I'll talk about that in a second. But very clearly what's going on here is a conversion of polymorph one to polymorph two. And so we decided we needed an analytical method to monitor that in support of drug product development. So now we need a method to follow this conversion analytically. And at the present time, this project was being carried out. We did not yet have the low-frequency Raman equipment in-house. So we turned to what is basically our workhorse analytical technique, which is X-ray powder diffraction. So the method development effort that I'm about to describe was led by uh, Simon Bates, who was at Triclinic at the time and now, as most of you, I think, know, is at Brigaku. So by looking carefully at the X-ray patterns, and you can see those on the slide were calculated from the single crystal data, we can notice uh, a couple of things. One is you can still see the freestanding peaks in blue that occur for the polymorph two pattern. But under the arrows, you can see what appear to be doublets. And that's because there are small but real differences in the positions of those peaks between the two polymorphs. Thus, full pattern analysis of X-ray patterns was undertaken to develop a semi-quantitative, which means non-validated, method to aid in drug product development. Now, we do quite a bit of this kind of work, development and validation of X-ray methods for quantitative analysis of solid mixtures. And I assume, as most of you realize, there's a lot more to this compared to uh, liquid techniques like HPLC. There are problems associated with solids analysis that I've listed here, starting with preferred orientation. I won't read them. But each of these problems can be an issue when developing a method. Some of these were an issue for us in this method development. So in the next few slides, I'll tell you how we address some of those issues. Preferred orientation is a common hindrance in interpretation of X-ray powder diffraction data. It occurs frequently for uh, materials like organics. And it is, for those who don't know, a non-random orientation of the crystallites in the specimen that causes relative peak intensity variations. Now, that's clearly a bar to quantitation if thought of in the traditional terms of correlating peak intensities or areas with analyte concentrations. So we wanted to know if preferred orientation would be an issue for us here. So what was done is to analyze freshly crystallized samples of both polymorphs in both reflection and transmission geometries. Now, for the transmission measurements, specimens were prepared by compressing the material into pellets. And the expectation is that pressure changes would change the amount of alignment that would be visible as a uh, change in relative peak intensities. So from the comparison of the left side of the slide there, you can see the polymorph one does not exhibit different relative peak intensities. However, polymorph two does. So we're going to have a preferred orientation issue to deal with with polymorph two. And I'll discuss how that was handled in a bit. Now, probably the biggest problem we face in doing this kind of work is the inability to prepare standard mixtures. Uh, we know that solid mixtures are notoriously inhomogeneous, and so we must avoid subsampling at all costs unless it can be shown by experiment that it can be done. And also, the phase purity of starting materials need to be established. And in this case, the uh, inability to readily distinguish Polymorph 2 versus mixtures of polymorph 2 and polymorph 1 is an example of, of that unknown phase purity. And again, I will talk about how we handled that in a moment. Coupled with the inability to subsample, the size of typical specimen holders and minimum balance weight requirements present a major obstacle for this method development. 
For example, let's assume we could have fit 10 milligrams of material in our specimen holder, and the minimum amount of sample that we can accurately weigh is one milligram. That's actually the case at TriClinic. We have a six-place valence whose minimum weight is one milligram. So a common detection limit that we see requested by the FDA for these quantitative solid mixture analyses is about 5%. That is, the detection limit of one analyte in another is 5%. Well, since only one milligram of unwanted analyte can be accurately weighed, it must be mixed with 19 milligrams of the wanted component to give a 5% mixture. And it will then take two measurements to obtain data from the entire sample. Now, that problem increases greatly the lower the, the detection limit. We're at points where we have to do 20 or 30 different aliquots to measure a single sample. And that becomes practically not something you want to do. So I'll discuss in a bit how we handle that in the development of this method. One of the issues that I listed on slide eight was non-sample data. If we're going to develop a method, we want the data going into that method to come only from our sample. And in X-ray diffraction, there are sources of data from things other than the sample, as I've listed there, uh, air scattering, Compton scattering, and Bremstrahlung, which is a continuous wavelength from the two. Now, there's a few ways to handle that. Uh, one way is to collect data from an empty sample holder and subtract it from the specimen data. But we find more often than not, we use digital filtration. And we typically will do that filtration followed by a smoothing and a normalization step. Now, the effect of the digital filtration is shown on the left. And in that case, low frequency data is separated from high frequency data, which eliminates all the incoherent Compton and Bremstrahlung scattering. You can see that the measured pattern on the top left after digital filtration provides the low frequency output, which is the red line, and the high frequency output, which is the data that we want. And then subtracting the red line from the measured pattern gives us that pattern on the upper right. You note, though, however, that such filtration will also remove contributions from any amorphous content in the specimen and therefore must be used only if applicable to your particular situation. So it was not the case herein that we were concerned with amorphous content. So this data pretreatment was applied to all of the, data, the sample data that we collected. The method that was ultimately developed, uh, we call a standardless X-ray powder diffraction method. And originally we used this to overcome the limitations of preparing physical standards. And so instead, we're using statistical methods to um, identify standards that can be used. So what we did was we measured X-ray data from a variety of samples of API that had different concentrations of polymorph 1 and 2 in there. And then we did PCA analysis of the resulting data since once that data had been pretreated. And what we found was anytime the data was treated as binary, that is, there were two reference patterns looked for they could not be found. That is, patterns could not be found whose combinations could recreate the measured patterns. However, when we said, let's limit the PCA to three components, now we did find three reference patterns whose combination would allow reconstruction of the measured patterns. Those are shown on the left. The first one was simply the standard pattern you get on measurement from pure polymorph one. And remember that did not show significant amounts of preferred orientation. But the other two patterns are both derived from polymorph two, and you see them there on the red and the blue pattern on the left. Now, it's interesting that the preferred orientation seen in polymorph two is manifested in intensity changes of peaks from a single crystallographic plane. And in fact, those reflections are what are in pattern two parentheses PO. That is, those reflections are all from a particular plane, and you can see the even spacing between the peaks. So what we have now is we have three patterns that allow us to do two things. One is we don't have to make physical standards. And secondly, we can now deal with the observed preferred orientation by separating the two, pattern two into those two patterns. Now, we found that the statistical identification of reference patterns is not only more easily done than preparation of physical samples, but it allows us to develop methods for preparation of physical samples as either impractical or, or in some cases impossible. And that approach has gained some acceptance, but not yet widely. And in particular, we find that regulatory personnel will accept what they know, which is physical standards. So we're hoping that as this becomes used more and more, it becomes also acceptable to regulatory bodies.
the full pattern x-ray method that was developed was used to process the x-ray data that were collected from that experiment I described earlier where we did an interconversion at 40 degrees C. And the data that resulted are plotted on the left-hand plot. Uh, the right-hand plot on this slide is the same particle size plot that I showed you earlier. And note that the shaded areas represent the same amount of time in that the time scales on the x-axis are different. But we are able to follow the conversion pretty well with x-ray. And under the conditions that that uh, experiment was carried out where the left-hand plot is, is showing that a conversion occurred in around 10 to 20 hours, not far from where we're seeing it in the particle size plot. So that method was used, that x-ray method was used to aid in developing drug products. And the first thing that was done was to add an aging period to the drug product to allow that change to occur. But finally, it was simply used polymorph 2 to begin with, so a change would not occur. And it turned out that you can get polymorph 1 or polymorph 2 from solvent. Solvent controls that. Polymorph 1 results from methyl ethyl ketone, and polymorph 2 results from alcohol crystallization. It was at this point in the project, basically quite near the end, that Triclinic acquired the, the capability of doing LF Roman spectroscopy. So we went ahead and applied it here to see if it would be helpful in projects such as these in the future. So first, a brief introduction to low-frequency Raman spectroscopy. I'm sure, as most of you know, standard Raman spectroscopy probes vibrations about chemical bonds. And those occur in the wavelength range shown here on this slide. The lower end of that range, which is about 500 reciprocal centimeters, is where the Rayleigh line dominates the signal. To obtain vibrational data below about 500 reciprocal centimeters, we interfaced an ONDAX filter to our Renishaw NVIA Raman spectrometer and microscope. That filter suppresses the Rayleigh line so that the lower wavelengths can be attained. Along with that filter, various probes were obtained at Triclinic. The immersion probe allows spectral acquisition by simple contact or by immersion in a slurry. The vial tablet probe allows us to get spectra from material in a vial or from an intact tablet. And also, low-frequency Raman in spectra can be obtained through the NVIA microscope. The vibrations that occur at low frequencies are phonon vibrations. Rather than vibrations about bonds, phonon vibrations are cooperative vibrations of a crystal lattice. And vibrations like that are shown in this slide. I borrowed the movie from the Wikipedia entry about phonons. And what you need to note here is that such vibrations will only occur in crystalline materials. That is where there's a crystal lattice. Here are low frequency Raman spectra of polymorphs one and two. There are two modes of scattering that are detected in low-frequency Raman spectroscopy called Stokes and anti-Stokes. The, uh, the spectra that were obtained show both modes. And in the spectra, the Stokes signals are the one to the right of the Rayleigh line. The anti-Stokes signals are the ones to the left. And the anti-Stokes signals are always somewhat less intense than the Stokes signals because they arrive from an excited vibrational state, which is less populated than the ground state. Well, in this slide, I show Raman spectra of polymorphs 1 and 2 displayed in a couple different ways. First, the top red spectrum in the overlay on the left side of the slide is the spectrum obtained of polymorph 2 in that standard fingerprint region, 500 to about 2,000 reciprocal centimeters, without the use of the Ondex filter. The blue spectrum is that obtained in that same range with the use of the Ondex filter. And you can see that the same spectrum was obtained in each case. In the overlay on the right-hand side of the slide, the additional spectral information provided by the ONDAX filter for each polymorph of 1 and 2 is shown. And in this case, I'm showing only the Stokes portions of those spectra. So there are two important points to get from this slide. The first is the entire Raman spectrum from about 0 to 3,000 reciprocal centimeters is obtained when you take a spectrum using the ONDAX filter. That, differenti that differentiates that technique from terahertz spectroscopy, which only samples the low-frequency region. The second point, and more important for this case, is the phonon peaks can clearly be used to differentiate polymorphs 1 and 2. We use low-frequency Raman spectroscopy in a couple ways in the project I've been discussing. 
And here's one of the experiments we ran to monitor crystallization in situ. As I mentioned earlier, solvent drives crystallization of each polymorph. One comes from methyl ethyl ketone and two comes from alcohols. The overlays at the top right show the Stokes portions of spectra obtained using our immersion probe as a solution of the API in methyl ethyl ketone was cooled from 56 to 23 degrees C and held at 23 C. The bottom overlay there is of the polymorph one and two spectra to use as comparators. And note that the spectra in the top overlay were isolated by digital subtraction of solvent signal. Well, the spectrum of the solution, which is the red trace, contains only that one broad featureless peak at about 10 reciprocal centimeters. But over time, the spectrum of polymorph one becomes evident as crystallization of that polymorph occurred. Remember that the Raman spectra of the polymorphs in the standard range, 500 to 3,000 reciprocal centimeters, are indistinguishable. Low frequency Raman spectroscopy we could then use to monitor both crystallizations and slurry interconversions. This slide shows a series of low frequency Raman spectra collected from mixtures of polymorphs one and two. We simply hand mixed the components and acquired multiple spectra from each of the mixtures using the contact probe. A more efficient way to do that is to slurry each mixture in a solvent in which it has no solubility and then collect spectra using the immersion probe or the moving slurry. However, the contact probe worked well in this case, although it was clear from the spectra we obtained that the mixtures were not homogeneous. That effect could be overcome, however, by co-addition of six spectra from each mixture. And you can see in the waterfall plot of the right, which are those co-added spectra, the transition from polymorph one, which is the black line in the front, to polymorph two, which is the black line in the rear, is evident. We were curious then to see if any measure of linearity exists in those spectra. That is, could those data be linearly related to polymorph content and afford a reasonable calibration line? The answer, using full pattern and least squares analysis of the data from the pure polymorphs and five mixtures, each consisting of six co-added spectra, the curves shown are, were generated. And that's pretty good linearity across a broad concentration range, the R value of 0 0.9945. The 50% mixture values you can see are a little bit off. Without those, the fit goes to about 0 0.996. But realize that the appropriate care with which mixtures are made and data are acquired when developing quantitative methods was not used here. The idea was simply to see if there's potential for low-frequency Raman spectroscopy to be used in a quantitative way. And obviously, there is. I believe that the little bit of Raman data that I've shown you here demonstrates the potential of this technique, but I wanted to note that we are certainly not the first to recognize that potential. And I've listed some references for anyone interested in how low-frequency Raman spectroscopy has been used by others. The first listed reference appears to be the first publication, at least first one I found, describing application of that spectroscopy to polymorphic systems. In that publication, polymorphs of the APIs oxcarbazepine, and chlorpropamid were shown to exhibit unique spectra. The other publications illustrate uses such as polymorph identification, monitoring two-phase and solid-state reactions, percent crystallinity determination, and also as the primary analytical technique to use for polymorph screening. I think that low-frequency Raman spectroscopy has great potential to solve problems in organic solid-state chemistry. We found it able to differentiate almost isoenergetic polymorphs, of which other samples exist. And in addition, the ability to watch crystallizations and two-phase interconversions in situ is proving to be of value. For example, we traditionally have monitored competitive slurry experiments, which are used to establish relative thermodynamic stabilities, by periodic isolation of aliquots of the solid phase and analysis of each by X-ray powder diffraction. Now, that can be done without removal of aliquots by in situ analysis. That's a savings in both time and material. Finally, the potential for quantitative analysis of solid mixtures is clear to me. As a lab that does a lot of method development to that end, an analytical technique that does not have all the issues associated with X ray powder diffraction is a great tool to have. I'd like to thank anyone who's listening, and again, thank Rigaku for the opportunity to present.
If any questions arise, please feel free to contact me at the email address shown here on this slide. Again, thank you.